G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. First of all, today's video is going to look a little bit different because I just realized in watching some of my videos on playback that I've had my video mirrored the entire time. So I've corrected that uh, and uh, we can see what I normally would look like. We're going to talk about electric mobility today, specifically electric vehicle fluids and what can the current lubricants industry bring to the table as we start to move to an era of e-mobility. So it means a few things for formulations, a um, few things for coolants, and so we'll talk a little bit about the chemistry and what it might mean for the industry. All right, let's get into it. All right, everyone, let's talk about electric vehicle fluids. Slightly uh, different to internal combustion engine vehicles, which I'm gonna call ICE from now on. Um, and let's consider what makes electric vehicle fluids different and what are kind of gonna be the new demands and how it might affect the industry. So let's start with the Porsche Taycan, which is, I'm, I'm pretty partial to this vehicle. I've always liked Porsches, not that I could ever afford one, um, but I've always liked the brand and kind of what they stand for. And I think that the Taycan represents something very interesting in that it's a legacy automaker that's really diving headfirst into the electric vehicle market. And I'm, I'm really interested to see whether they can, can pull it off. All the feedback from the Taycan has been really good up until this point, but it will it sort of remains to be seen uh, what's the kind of longevity and staying power. And part of the reason I think it's really interesting is because if you look under the hood, there is nothing particularly special about the Taycan. It looks like most other electric vehicles on the market in so much as from a 30,000 foot level, it looks like a, a, a skateboard platform, which is what you know Rivian is doing to an extent. It's what Tesla is doing. It's what Rimac's doing. Everything, everyone sort of has that um, you know battery integrated into the floor. You've got motors and transmissions, and you can do these in various configurations. Um, you know, you pick your voltage for the charging architecture. Porsche has gone with a very high voltage charging architecture. That'll have ramifications on battery cooling. Uh, but but what I think is really interesting specifically to Porsche is that as they are part of the VW group, the VW group is likely to take this skateboard and just replicate it across the entire range. So there'll be a VW, which is based on this platform. There'll be an Audi. There is already an Audi based on this platform, right? The Audi e-tron. And I think it's going to be really interesting uh, to, you know, how do you differentiate all of these different brands? Now, I know that all the big manufacturers already did this with ICE vehicles, right? They, they all had a, a shared architecture underneath. But I think that electric vehicles kind of take this to the next level. You can really drop any body onto this and, it, and it's, a, it's a new car. Anyway, I think that's quite interesting. But now let's talk specifically about the fluids because some of the technologies are gonna be exactly the same, right? Okay, we still have a steering rack. It has to do steering. We still have wheel bearings. There's gonna be wheel bearing grease. That stuff doesn't really change all that much. What does change is things like the battery cooling system. Now, first of all, there are a couple of different variations on this within the EV world. And one of the reasons why EVs are so exciting at the moment is because it's not like we've all landed on what's the optimal design. There are quite a few variations out there. So the original Nissan Leaf, for example, was air-cooled. It's completely passive cooling. Um, some vehicles have gone for uh, water cooling on the outside. Um, some are going with integrated cooling with uh, liquid lubricants. You know, Porsche's gone that route. Um, so I think there's some interesting variations on battery cooling technology. Then, of course, you've got the transmission and the motors, some of which are integrated together and use a, a common liquid to, to cool and protect them, some of which aren't. So we'll talk about the difference between a dry motor and a wet motor, right? Where a wet motor has is bathed in oil that is generally also uh, protecting the transmission. So let's talk about these ones in orange and then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. So I want you to try and think of EV fluids from the perspective of the formulator, right? So if I'm trying to formulate a new lubricant, how do I pick and choose from among the technologies? Well, I've got to really think about the application and its demands. One of the easiest way to do that is to, with this spider chart. So if you've been in the lubricants industry at all, you will have seen one of these where on the different vertices of this octagon, I'm gonna put you know, the different requirements. And the further out you go, the higher the demand. So motor cooling, 
right? Hugely important. Motors get really hot, right? We want to cool them as much as possible. Now, specifically, uh, motor cooling is going to be really important in both dry and wet motors. However, if we have a wet motor, then we also have to consider the electrical insulation properties, right? So if I'm bathing the entire motor in a liquid lubricant, uh, that lubricant probably shouldn't be water or something very conductive. Similarly, the copper windings inside the electric motor are now going to be complete interacting with a, a, a liquid. And we need to make sure that that liquid is compatible with the copper. Then we think start to think about efficiency. Okay, you know, in reality, efficiency should have been important uh, to ICE vehicles as well. And it has been to a certain extent over the last few years, partially because regulation has pushed us that way. But the market is the one who is demanding efficiency from electric vehicles. And I find this sort of more interesting in some ways. So the market is putting this huge emphasis on range and there's this idea of range anxiety. So that means that electric vehicle manufacturers have to eke out every small bit of efficiency that they can. So let's disregard lubricants, for example. If you've seen a Tesla Model 3 on the road, you'll most of them have those kind of funny hubcaps that look very different to every other hubcap you've seen. And they're designed specifically because they're trying to be as aerodynamic as possible um, to, to get as much range as possible, right? They're trying to reduce the amount of drag. The Porsche Taycan, for example, you know, in the advertising materials, <laughs> actually uh, advertises its coefficient of drag, right? So for the... Uh, the Taycan Turbo, I think it's 0.22, and for the, the Turbo S, I think it's uh, 0.25. Uh, so that's something that we haven't really seen in ICE vehicles as much. Now, in the case of electric vehicles, the lubricant is going to contribute to the efficiency because we obviously want smooth running of the transmission as well as the electric motor. But we also have to consider things like weight, right? So the, the mass of a system is going to reduce the overall efficiency and range of the system as well. So we have to take that into consideration. Film thickness. So if we are protecting that transmission, we need to have sufficient film thickness that the gears aren't constantly grinding against each other. Thermo-oxidative stability. So again, the market is demanding that EV fluids are changed very infrequently. So when people buy an electric vehicle, one of their expectations is that there is very little maintenance involved. So if we have an electric vehicle that needs to be taken into for a service every six months, people will say, well, what's the benefit over an ICE vehicle? So that means that for our cooling fluids, we need to last a lot longer than we have. Foam control, that's really important in the transmission. Um, so it can, uh, at really, really high speeds, we are concerned with foam control partially because it affects the film thickness that we just talked about. And finally, anti-wear. So we're probably going to need some kind of anti-wear additive because again, with the transmission, there's uh, gears. Um, and at slow speeds, before we've been able to develop a, a film, we're going to need to protect those. <clears throat> All right. So now let's talk about a, a wet motor. So motor cooling is obviously important. It needs to have electrical insulation properties. It needs to be very compatible with copper, really good efficiency. It needs to develop a thick film. It needs to be very stable, have foam control and an anti-wear package. So you can see that for a wet motor application, this lubricant really needs to do everything. Now, let's think about a dry motor, right? And how that affects some of the choices because now you don't really need it, that same lubricant to cool the motor you don't really need electrical insulation properties out of it. You don't need copper compatibility because it's not coming into contact with the windings. You still need good efficiency, right? Out of the out of the transmission. You still need film thickness. You don't need as much oxidative stability because <clears throat> the motor <clears throat> is what's generating a lot of the heat. You need foam control still to a certain extent. You need a really good anti-wear package. Okay, so the the demands on a dry motor lubricant are very, very different. All right, now let's consider the trade-off between some of these. So as an example, if I want very good thermo-oxidative stability, 
as a formulator, that drives me towards a very high quality base oil. Something like, you know, group three, group three plus, um, maybe a, a, even a PAO, right? That drives me in that direction. Foam control, funnily enough, also drives me in that direction, right? So we know that PAOs are, and I've explained this in a previous video, have very uh, good foam control, right? So that's good. Both of these choices are leading us in the same direction. Now, efficiency is where it kind of gets interesting. So for efficiency, we want to control two things. One is the traction coefficient, right? So again, in between the, the, the gear teeth, we want a low traction coefficient so that those gear teeth, you know, uh, don't, uh, they're able to transfer energy really well and the liquid lubricant is not going to heat up all that much. So we want something like a PAO. On the other hand, we want something with very low viscosity, right? Because low bulk viscosity is easier to move around, right? So especially if we want to try and cool the battery, we want something with really low viscosity. But if we have something with very low viscosity, we're not necessarily going to develop enough film thickness for the transmission, right? So that's where the trade-off comes. So we need probably something with, um, we want something with a pretty decent VI, but if we also want it to carry heat around the system, we want it to get thin at very high temperatures. So you can see, again, those choices, they don't really go together, right? They clash. We have a similar problem when it comes to the anti-wear package and copper compatibility. So most of the anti-wear additives, you know, ZDDP is the classic one, don't play nicely with copper. In fact, this process of copper passivation is often a, a direct result of the anti-wear pack. So we're going to have to come up with some new additive chemistry, potentially. It also drives decisions in the base oil, right? So um, traditionally, sulfur is quite an active element and wants to attack copper. Well, we want to reduce the amount of sulfur in the base oil. So that's also going to drive us towards group three and PAO. We want something with decent electrical insulation properties. So that's not water, right? So most um, lubricants, especially the very non-polar ones like PAOs have good insulating properties. And again, for motor cooling, we want something similar. Now, motor cooling and electrical insulation in some ways go against each other, right? The specific heat of water is unmatched compared to hydrocarbons. So for, from a cooling perspective, we want to use water. But if we need to have electrical insulation properties, we can't use water. So again, these two things go against each other and we're going to have to make a compromise. All right, that was a little bit wordy, but um, now let's look at the impact on the overall industry. So this was some data that came out of McKinsey and said, you know, what is the impact going to be on the overall global lubricants market? And they looked at specifically just the, the transport sector. So I don't think that we're looking at heavy industry here, you know, mining and haul trucks and all this kind of stuff. It's more road transport. And this is their prediction of the sort of the, the PCMO market. I'm calling it PCMO, but it's really uh, vehicles and, and, and trucks, right? So on, on road transport. And the numbers given here are billions in gross revenue effectively for, for the oil companies. So they see the growth slowing and slowing and slowing and towards the 2030s, it's really gonna peak and then sort of flatline. Now, how much of a contribution are EVs gonna make? Well, it's gonna grow at a very, very large rate, but because they're starting off such a small base, the absolute number is going to be minuscule. So it's not enough to make up for the loss that we're going to have over the next you know 20 years now there are some variations on that right and they're driven by choices that the oems are going to make let me explain this so in the porsche taycan as an example um the the, the fluid system that does the cooling and cools the uh the motor as well as the battery pack as well as the transmission, it's all integrated. Really, really cool system. And you know, the Tesla is doing something similar as well. But that again drives some complexity in the in the fluid choices. Now, one of the things is that one of the big choices that OEMs are going to have to make in future 
is do we cool a battery with a dielectric fluid, so something like an oil, or do we make a choice to go with something that's water-based or an aqueous solution, maybe a water glycol mixture or something like that? That's a huge choice to make because it's a real trade-off between uh, complexity and you know simplicity. Now, depending, there are a couple of variations on this. So maybe, for example, only sports cars choose to use dielectric coolants. And McKinsey thinks that if that's the case, this is what EV fluids look like. It trends up, right? But for the most part, we're using aqueous fluids. If, however, we say that maybe premium vehicles will use dielectric fluids, then the market will look something more like this. And finally, if all EV manufacturers, whether it's cheap, bargain basement, right through to your, to your Maybachs, uh, decide to use dielectric fluids, then the market will look something like more like this. Now, again, the number on the left is billions in gross revenue. Now, one thing that you'll notice is that in comparison with the total market uh, as it stands now, this you know 1.1 billion in revenue is still a drop in the ocean. Whether we like it or not, if EVs become very widely adopted, then uh, they just simply don't use as much lubricant as uh, as, as current vehicles do. So we are going to see a bit of a, a step change in how vehicles are protected. Anyway, um, this is obviously not my specialty and I'm trying to do with the, the best with the information that's out there. There is actually very little information. So I hope that you got something out of this. Um, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them down in, in the comment section below. Otherwise, as usual, this has been Lubrication Explained.